o'clock in the afternoon. It's a, a summer day, usually followed by winter. And as you know, uh, so as uh, Thomas Friedman said, we're not really on climate change. We're dealing with the year's weather. The uh, uh, weather patterns are really weird. But it's here as a very well. Uh, this is the third in what is a, uh, has been a series. Can you hear me now? Yeah. It's not at and t but it's. At any rate, this is the third in a series of, can you leave my photos right here? This is the third in a series of lectures that has dealt with the uh, Paris climate uh, change talks. Uh, and it was really an attempt to learn first and foremost what words, what came out of the discussions in Paris what role that community-based organizations in both in the United States and abroad in developing countries as well as frontline communities at home were taking in that struggle. Uh, and then what role uh, a number of those groups were in particularly uh, engaging in, which was the second lecture, both on a city-wide level, on a state, regional level, and on a national level. And the intent today is to basically absorb all of that discussion uh, and move forward and basically say, what should be our agenda as, a, uh, as, uh, as individuals? As we think from citizens to academics uh, to community leaders and others uh, as we begin to move forward uh, in the next couple of years in, in addressing uh, the issue of climate change. And it was interesting that on March 30th, there was an uh, article in the New York Times called The Climate Model Predicts West uh, Antarctic Ice Sheet melt rapidly. I read this uh, uh, with uh, a great deal of trepidation. I, I have six grandkids, and this article basically now addresses the fact that what they thought would take thousands of years may take just decades for the West Arctic uh, ice sheet, which is the size of Mexico, to melt, and which will result in increases in sea level rise that far exceed anything we thought might occur. And so the issue that we're talking about today uh, really has to deal with not only the midterm uh, uh, and long-term issues that climate change uh, that we talk about, we talk about adaptation and, uh, and, uh, and mitigation measures, but it really has to do with what we begin to, what are the challenges that we may have to take on not many years from now, maybe in the next decade or so. Uh, the issue of housing, for instance. Many of the vulnerable populations in the city of New York live right in the areas that might, we may have to see us withdrawing from in the next decade or so. We know how uh, critical uh, the housing shortage is and how hard it is to develop and find affordable housing. And can you imagine what would take place if we had to address the needs of uh, removing countless people from the Rockaways or parts of southern Brooklyn or other vulnerable areas, where would they live? How would we be able to accommodate uh, that kind of a population? So the challenges that we're talking about today uh, provide us with a number of really ominous scenarios, but also maybe some uh, uh, ways of really improving the quality of life that we have ahead of us. So we must take advantage of the issues that we confront, uh, both from a positive uh, as well as a defensive uh, point of view. We have four points people today, uh, two of whom will make presentations, and two of whom are best to react to those presentations from their unique perspective. And each of you should have a copy of the sheet, and on the back are the several uh, 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 the bios, or really brief bios of each individual, and I suggest you read them as uh, uh, as people come, come forth, uh, or even after their presentations. I'll just mention them in the order that they'll be speaking to you. The first is Ilya Azarov, who's the founding partner of LAB Architects P L C L C and a faculty member at the New York City uh, College of Technology. And he's done a lot of work with the AIA on really disaster prevention strategies. And he'll be making the initial presentation. He'll be followed by Juan Camilo Osario, who's the director of research at the New 
York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and also an adjunct faculty member at Pratt Institute, and, a, and a, uh, a good friend that is here, by the way. And then following that uh, will be Colvin Branham. Uh, Colvin is uh, the executive director and president, the CEO and president of Bedside Restoration Corporation. And I've asked him to come forward based and uh, to comment primarily on what the reaction uh, that he has to what he will be hearing here today and what his concerns are based on the, the uh, people that he serves uh, in the veterans' lives and their struggles uh, and how this issue of climate change might affect them. And then uh, my colleague, Jamie Stein, who heads up the program uh, at Pratt around sustainable environmental systems programs and has uh, been working in communities and is both an academic and an activist uh, 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 will uh, talk about the role uh, from a professional standpoint. And then, uh, I, I hope that all of us in the room will begin to talk about it from the perspective uh, that affects us as individuals, the role we play, and hopefully collectively we can come up with some ideas as how we, as how we should move forward. So without any more uh, discussion, I'm just going to call uh, to make the first presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. I don't know which one is, this is the one that's working. Great. You guys all hear me? Great. I see a lot of friendly faces in the, uh, in the audience, and I'm going to see if I can get this um, screen on. There's my name, Clay Azroff, and what um, I'm going to present to you today. Ron asked me to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the COP21. Um, what I'm going to talk about is some of the unforeseen consequences. The best thing that we can do as architects and individuals is not look at solution sets or problems in a linear way, but they are more like the viewer web. The interconnectivity of everything that is happening is so profound that you can't see it all at once. And I think the position that we are in at the AIA is something we're going to get to in the second part of this. But uh, for now, uh, we have to talk about the time. And the time is the moment where we are finally seeing our legislators and the common person being shaken awake. And it has taken many disasters along the way. It's taken many scientists screaming at the top of their lungs. But until people have been affected personally, that they finally woke up to this fact. And I feel as though Sandy in our region was the shaking of our bed to finally wake up. And let's hope it's not too late to actually come and sit at breakfast and have a nice discussion about it, rather than run out of the house altogether saying it's falling down. And so that's sort of where we're coming from. Um, we've seen a lot of these graphs, but this is up till February 2016. This is how fast and how rapid this is changing, how rapid the temperature, the climate, the, the, the carbon output is quickly changing the environment. The temperature of the seas, as Ron alluded to, you can see those two blue patches. The two blue patches are the historic record colds. That is where the ice is melting and changing the pH composition of our greatest asset, which is the ocean. And so coupled with that, we look at the record heats around the world. 2015 crushed all records the record we don't want to have. And if you look at what is in the next 18 months versus the next 10 years, what you need to be looking at, whether it's large scale migration versus food security, you name it. These are things that are identified as tied to climate change directly. And remember that newer web that I said, interconnectivity. Here's a shot of the Great Barrier Reef. All of you on social media is trending last week, trending earlier this week because it, they're, they're, <coughs> the loss of the Great Barrier Reef is at hand. This is not in the future, this is at hand. The great bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, one of the 
largest, if not the largest, organism in the world is at risk. And that's because of the pH change, that's because of the carbon, that's because of all the things that were talked about at COP21. And then, of course, here's our record temperatures uh, through February of 2016 in the United States. So the wacky weather that Ron mentioned and, and, and all the, the ice melt um, just confirms worldwide that we're in this together. And so this idea of COP21 finally getting together, whether it was the Kyoto Accord before or before or before, and states not really getting shook in the wake and seeing what the problems are, we see them in very simple diagrams that children can understand. But when our legislators don't believe them, that's where we have had the problem. And I think that has been the greatest change. Here's some of the things that people don't really recognize. By 2050, hunger and child malnutrition will increase by 20% due to climate change. This is due to climate change. 23% um, of all casualties around the world, all deaths, are related to climate. 23%. That's a staggering amount. 12.6 million people die every year because of climate. That should be way from you, Rob. This, just take a look at this. Every 10 degree increase is a doubling of bacteria. So not only is food security, but the incident of infection and disease and bacteria goes up with every degree the earth warms. Every degree. And then of course, 80% of all natural disasters are climate related. That goes without saying. And with the warming global temperatures, 5% decrease in growing seasons, growing seasons for the next four years, which means 265 million more people will have food insecurity just based on that, right? So we're thinking about warming temperatures, great, I'm mean, gonna increase my air conditioning, no, or I build a better building, no, that's not the whole picture. The whole picture is all of this. This is just a little tiny bit of it. Uh, climate change will result in between 150 million to 2 billion migrants or immigrants because of climate. That's within their countries and internationally. We're seeing a lot of uh, migration now. Some of those patterns are tied to climate change. Now the second part of the presentation. So that is sort of getting us into the, to the wheelhouse of it's not an easy fix and it is pervasive through everything we do and everything that you do has an effect on this formula however small. So what I'm going to talk about now is what the AIA is engaged in from the standpoint of national down to our very local level. I'm going to really talk about the local level because I want to connect with all of you in this room of how we make a change or can benefit from being together in this room tonight for New York City. So New York, panels, New York City panel on climate change is, um, I'm sure you've heard a great deal about. We've been working very closely with them and had several um, wonderful interactions and lectures and presentations. They have now asked the AIA to be part of these teams that are really looking at, at the built environment and what that means. And so if we're looking at the sea level rise and just these simple diagrams, the number of people, the number of buildings at risk, and we're putting back to them those buildings, the age of those buildings, each of those buildings has a lot of deleterious material that is not safe for the environment. You can't just leave those buildings. You have to remove them all if the sea is going to advance. Otherwise, you bleed the sea in a very profound way. Uh, this is two degrees of Celsius climate change tied to COP21. That's Coney Island, and there you go. There is the effect. That's two degrees. And so whether that comes by 2100 or with the accelerated news that we just heard Ron mention, that could come in decades. I love those neighborhoods. Uh, but look at all of what is the built environment made of and what that does to the environment of the sea. Um, if, we, if I can get this thing to work. This is actually, put this together. Oh, you can already see it. This is the map. We're here. We're in this building. So here's how the, the, the uh, two degrees Celsius will change the waterfront over the next, this says 2100, but that should be accelerated now. Um, and we're not alone because the Maldives will be well gone by that point. And here are the climate refugees. Where are they going to go? Are we going to harbor them, as well as their culture, their language? their libraries, their art, everything, where do they go? Um, and by 2100, we're not in the worst shape. This is the British Isles. This is 2100. This is climate change. To the same degree we lost Coney Island, but this is what you're going to see 
has that kind of a loss. So if you think we're in trouble, that's some serious trouble. So, but let's look ahead at opportunities. Over the next several years, by 2030, 900 billion square feet is going to be built throughout the world. That's three and a half times the amount of buildings there are in the United States now. Here's an opportunity where if we change the conversation of how we build and how efficient they are, and what kind of carbon goes into them in the building process, as well as the carbon that they harvest, repair the environment as they're being built. This is an opportunity that the AIA architects, engineers, everyone in this room can be part of. But here's the fragility of that. There are 2,444 2, new coal-fired plants that are planned worldwide today, even if only half of them are put together, right? Only half. Then we will far exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius, irregardless of what the governing bodies are talking about in Paris. So how do all players get on board? How do we put this into a way of thinking that it is beneficial economically, socially, and environmentally to not build these? What is the alternative? And that's where architects, engineers, innovation, adaptation comes into play. We certainly have the technology means to get rid of all of this. So the one thing I did want to mention, the AIA put out what's called this issue paper. It's 18 pages. I brought a copy. You can download it for free from AIA.org. This is right after uh, the COP21. This outlines every action that AIA is going to be doing nationally. We're adopting some very stringent um, guidelines in terms of code adoption, energy use, how we're putting our buildings together, and this will come rapidly. It's already coming rapidly in terms of the code changes. So we are very proactive about this. We know that our hair is on fire, not just us, it's everyone's. And, um, so it's already starting in D.C. We've started here in, in New York City. Um, we are on the task forces with one city, uh, built to last, with the mayor's office, as far as the AI is concerned. And then, of course, we've been working with the 2100 reports of how we look at today versus tomorrow in terms of energy distribution, microgrids, and this is what it should look like in the future working with the state government. We're also a part of the REV um, Reinvisioning, um, reforming the energy vision, and working very closely as AI members all across the state by implementing some of these, some of these, um, uh, or getting involved in some of these projects. And this is a 40% reduction of GH, uh, uh, GHGs, as well as 50% generation, and and you can see that these these targets can be met. And this is not as stringent as we need to go. I'm not going to go through some of these pieces, but what, what I wanted to do is, I think I've lost the screen here. Is take you oops. Is take you to um, the last ten slides, which are here. Um, let's see it on the screen. Is that it? Yeah. So this is the the New York Task Force of. How do I get this from the full screen? Bottom right. Thank you. So the AIA New York chapter put together the 80 by 50 task force, and this is how we're dealing with it in New York City. Is that what we have as the challenge is over 70% of all of our carbon emissions that come from buildings. And if we take a look at over all of these, these pieces, including what's laid out in COP21. These are the achievable goals, and we believe that architects must be part of that change. The commitment that we have next is that the AIA has signed with the City of New York a commitment for the next 35 years. We've created a director of sustainability, uh, Lori Kerr, who is with Urban Green, and we put together a very large task force to take this on. We're meeting on a bi-weekly basis. And here are the goals. Just take a look at those arrows. This is where we are now at the top, at the 2015 code. That's our requirements now. To get to COP21, you see the bottom of those two arrows? That's where we need to go. So we are going to drive code and zoning and everything of how we build and be proactive in making those changes so we can get there fast. So we just are adopting the, 20, the 2015 code now uh, in New York State. It's not enough. And the state knows it. And after COP21, the AIA knows it and the city knows it. So these, these are, that, that's for new construction. For existing construction, 
Similarly, this is when you do a retrofit in the city, this is what your expectation is, and you can see the goals and targets. So the people on this task force, including myself, are really looking at these as opportunities. This is somewhere between five and ten billion dollars in fees in terms of retrofit to get us there. So there is the carrot for the architects who are saying, well, you know, I'm already building a lead building, not enough. Well, I'm already following city code, not enough. We have to go much further, and if you go much further, the benefit is we can help stave off the changes, but we can also build a better community that we're in. And um, so the project overview, training, resources, business models, convenings, and advocacy. And that's the pots we've been working in. And then the last slide here is the first phase, is right now we're identifying what skills architects need to know. The majority of the architects in the city, do we know how to build this way? No, we don't. So that's the first phase, is, is the education portion. We're doing a series of demonstration buildings, identify architects that already know how to build this way, whether it's through passive means, through energy generation, uh, working with the mayor's office to see what opportunities there are in terms of client financing and benefits to really turn the client towards building a better building. And then, of course, that's where the resources come in. So with that, that's where we are with the AIA. And I'll leave this up here after our discussion to try to get you into the issue paper. Uh, it does have a lot of great information, a lot of statistics that would floor you um, as where we're at in terms of the built environment. Thank you very much.